um, questions and answers. Can uh, you unmute the microphones for us? And uh, all right. <clears throat> I see here, um, if I can go to some of the chats. Um, I see Bradley said about the encryption um, of the communication. Um, that sits there. Um, if I can maybe say something about that. Um, the built-in modem with the SIM card, if you use an APN, uh, already creates a, a, a sandboxed environment for you and uh, but in the case of when when you are a private uh, citizen or a, a company um, most of the time the data actually have to go through the um, internet which is public and open on that side and uh, as i mentioned before we use a vpn to establish a secure connection from the device right through to the other side so it's exactly the same as what you have with a banking transaction or the machine sitting out in the field with a banking transaction uh, role based security is there, so only users with the right access can, can access data. And uh, also on the alarms, uh, the, don't fear, you can sign on to different levels of alarms. So only the, you, you can, for instance, even on the power quality, the dip events and so on, you can filter out and say, I want to be warned about events that's longer than and deeper than. And so only show me the extreme events that's, that's happening. <clears throat> Any other questions for me? Good morning, Mel. You don't have a question for me? Not at the moment. <laughs> Good to see you. Hello. Hello, Phil. I can hear. Um, I think maybe for some of our Australian audience, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you would monitor something that is being investigated at the moment and is a potential larger and larger problem, which is uh, voltage angle jump, phase jump, and the effect on inverters? How would you monitor that? And provide maybe an anti-islanding signal um, to some inverters, depending on their effect on stability at the substation. Thank you, Phil. The depth recording um, side of our device uh, or any diagnostic information that comes off from the device includes all phase information, for instance, um, we, during a voltage dip, you will have um, waveform data, you will have half cycle, and uh, we update the half cycle values every zero cross, so there, are, there will be six half cycle um, readings in one cycle um, from it. And at the same time, we record the three phase phaser during the event. Um, uh, and together with uh, THD and all the other uh, uh, higher level parameters that sits there. So all the diagnostic information that goes with um, uh, events like voltage sags contain phase information. So you can see when a sag has happened, whether it was with phase jump or without phase jump. So it's an, an, an additional attribute to um, the, the uh, event. Um, we have built in the past, um, but, but we removed that just for complexity sake, sake and so on, the ability to trigger not just on amplitude changes, but also on phase angle changes. So um, if, if that is our particular need, we can, because a phase jump is not, uh, was not defined in the um, power quality standards on the other side. And, uh, but it is an absolute formality to bring that monitoring um, part back on it. But I think the other question is on the stability of the network and, and, and to look at frequency, uh, rate of change of frequency and so on. 
and uh, we do record synchrophasers. Um, so you can enable a recording of that. Um, uh, synchrophasers are um, a three-phase voltage and current set and frequency. So it's a set of data that um, uh, is, is updated once every cycle, but it's not updated on the zero cross. So, so um, the phaser can be in any place when the 10 to 20 milliseconds for 50 hertz happen um, internationally. And by recording two phases at different locations, and if you make it one a reference, you can see the variance, variation from one phase to the other one. Now, um, traditionally you require a PMU with all its uh, infrastructure and all uh, expensive infrastructure and so on to bring back that kind of information. Now, this is included in the Vector3 for free. It sits there. And um, so we, we haven't defined any um, triggering or monitoring um, uh, agents to monitor the performance of synchrophasers. And, uh, but that's also coming very soon. So it, the, the first time or the first moment when um, customers are asking us to say, uh, can we record phase jumps? Can we look at um, network instability and then define in the network stability first and so on, we would be able to record these kind of events and, and, and bring them as um, individual events and not just as a, a, a stream of data that need to be an, analyzed afterwards. So to say Sorry. short, to, to, to just on a short, to just summarize that one, um, sorry, Michael, we can record okay. events, but we can also do trends. And on the trend side, um, we can bring statistics as well. Michael? Can you provide an example where Otello has been used to avoid system collapse when an extreme event has occurred? Um, Michael, in South Africa, unfortunately, we don't have... Um, um, similar kind of problems that you have um, in, 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 in Australia. So um, for us, it's, you know, when things happen, we have load shedding. And, and uh, so uh, the moment when the frequency, network frequency drop and so on, ESCOM themselves just push the button and throw off a tremendous amount of loads. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, the, the case here is different than in Australia. Yes, yeah, certainly not uh, socially acceptable here, but it does happen. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Willie, I have another question that may be relevant in the future. Yes. Hello? Yes, Phil. Uh, Apologize. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, the, the degree of um, accuracy you have with your phaser measurements? For example, if you wanted in a microgrid to provide protection, you may have to resort to differential relaying because uh, inverters um, don't push out much more short circuit current than their full load. Would yes, would you be um, able to address that particular problem by using yes. differential relay relaying measuring, for instance, phaser deltas? Yeah, full. Um, protection is personally not my strong point uh, on, on that side, so my apologies uh, on, on uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, the real application of the protection side. What I can say is that um, on the device itself, the fact that we are time synchronized to within plus minus 100 nanoseconds from absolute time, um, the micro synchrophaser that has been recorded is... Uh, the, the resolution, the phase angle resolution is very small. So we can pick up phase angle changes. Um, I'm going to lie. I think it's a, a 0.1 degree. Um, I think that's the resolution of, of the phase angles um, in there. I haven't looked lately on, on what it is, but it's a very small um, change that can be picked up on that side. So the question there thereafter is, for instance, on the protection side, is how do you integrate, especially with the differential relay, the communication so that you have, um, keep in mind, I've got a, on the device itself, we've got an operating system and the operating system has got some delays. Although that the time, the, the data is properly timestamped, 
to communicate from one device to the other device might introduce some delays. So uh, on, on that scheme itself, I can't respond, Phil, but on the accuracy of the data itself, all is there. So with that, if you want to do it, um, if you can do something on the device itself, we can instantaneously respond uh, to it from the device. And the device has got four relay outputs as well. So you can directly control four um, uh, outputs and at the same time also four digital inputs. So um, you, can, you can control and verify um, what's happening. Thank you. Did you see my chat question, which was on being able to extend Otello in the future um, to control the distribution grid edge, um, possibly using fuzzy logic, possibly using uh, swarm optimization um, to control inverters. Yes, yes. <clears throat> I think um, the the it's 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 big words um, to use in in the early stages, but it's going to be very very important in the later stages. And uh, if I can just break this uh, question maybe up in, into two parts. Um, the one part is that you need to digitize the grid and to have data available to analyze so that you can use um, fuzzy logic and all these kind of things. So that's the second part is that data need to be analyzed um, because they change, they constantly change. The network is a living organism. Um, new feeds come in and, and so on. And we need to understand um, the parameters driving it. And then the, the third layer that sits here, so you now know what's going on in the grid, and so you now know what to do. The, th the last one is, where is the knobs to turn to make the effect? So the Internet of Things market offers us a nice um, a way to, to do that. So um, if the inverters, uh, the behind the meter inverters are not connected, um, to the uh, utility. Uh, connection can be established through the Internet of Things market, but it can also be established through dedicated um, devices, maybe installed um, at, at the inverters. But I think one of the most important parts of, of this whole thing is um, you've got to have, the, you've got to get them connected. Somehow you've got to have um, access to the loads that need to be switched on and off, and you need to have access to the inverters themselves. We've, we've got a, a, a strategy on how to do that. And if I can maybe uh, run a little bit ahead on, on that. Um, uh, we, we are in the um, user requirement phase of uh, looking at um, an edge monitoring device. In other words, the, the Vector 3 and the Tello system right now is a top down. So it's a, it's a, um, a top of class, best of class kind of technology that we have um, uh, right now in there. But there is a tremendous need to monitor and control on the edge. And the edge will be um, from um, uh, maybe cab banks uh, located in the low voltage system, uh, uh, mini sub we call them, but that, that last transformer that sits uh, up there um, for two pole mounted transformers, two um, inverters and, and so on, yes. Um, can I pose another question, um, which is about Western Australia, Willie? Please, please, Phil, just don't make them difficult. <laughs> Go for it, no, no. <laughs> um, but I think this is actually quite an important one. Um, it was recently reported in the, in the Australian press, actually the Financial Review, that in WA there is now a, um, the, various large users are being encouraged to use electricity because system strength is being affected by the amount of feed-in from solar. Now in the case of Carnarvon, a long way away from where this problem is occurring, but because they're, they're smaller grids, um, this problem is in part addressed by measuring smart meters 
and controlling those inverters which can be controlled, which is not everyone. Legacy stuff just is either on or islanded. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, so could you, if, if you were said, if, if you were given the problem, okay, instead of doing this, which is getting people to consume electricity, quite frankly, I find this more crazy, I think is the word. Uh, and I think many people agree with that. How could you employ an Otello system? Uh, because I'm aware that people have tried um, to interest users in WA in this, um, but I don't think there's been much traction. But how would you go solving a problem that I've just described? So rather than consuming electricity to stabilize, if you were the electrical engineer in charge, what would you do? So I think um, the, the uh, again, there's an engineering side and, and uh, then the commercial side uh, of, of things. Um, the challenge that you have here is that you need to balance generation and consumption. And, and uh, you, uh, if the, if the uh, dynamic performance or the dynamic uh, behavior of both of these are slow and and uh, steady state driven and so on, um, then obviously you can use uh, uh, half an hour, 15 minute or five minute uh, kind of data to control um, that. With other words, you, you, you have to have some knobs to turn um, uh, on, on, uh, on the one side uh, so, for instance, right now, if I'm correct, it's one-sided. They say generation generate, and uh, uh, if there are excess um, electricity being generated from behind the meter solution and so on, please consume more to keep the generators uh, producing a minimum load on that side. I think that um, aggregation um, of loads um, will be an, an interesting answer. So, if you do allow the generators to just constantly generate, then find customers that can use that electricity and make use of it uh, in a very effective way. And uh, this is where swarm control or, or aggregation actually comes in. So if you can find a lot of people that can effectively use little pieces of electricity and add them all together, and I think you've got a, a, a good solution um, doing on that side. But on the other hand as well, if you can control individual inverters out in the field by saying, guys, okay, we have a little bit too much right now. There is no market for you, sort of the back. Um, again, um, a lot of small, um, smaller, uh, so the burden is spread more on, on, on more people. The challenge that you have there, and uh, I can see this is a classic one, and I can see why the, the um, decision makers went for this way, um, if you can agree on 10 or 20 players to sort out the problem, it's 10 or 20 players to play with. But if you have to implement something that will include hundreds or thousands of smaller users, it's much more complex and so on, and uh, more difficult to handle. Um, so I can see why they went that, that route and so on. But um, I think there are tremendous opportunities um, in trying to control the smaller um, user at the end. So, so if, if I were the engineer on that side, I would really just start investigating and see um, the, to investigate the possibility of controlling and trying to, to match the, the demand and the, the generation uh, on a smaller scale and not just on a big scale. Because uh, full, this is exact, this is the big problem. It's just what they did is they just use fewer players to, to do exactly what is coming and going to happen in the future on your grid. Any other questions? Bradley, can you maybe point me if there was something asked in the um, chat side? 
if you just look in your chat, Vili, you will see um, a question from Michael. And uh, I've cited something that you could possibly use in your response in the yeah, chat. I think he's already answered that. Um, I right. couldn't find a way to send the message and I just did, didn't realize you um, <laughs> return rather than look for the send button. Just further to what Phil was saying, <clears throat> you know, as the market's evolving here and it's evolving very, very quickly in this space. Um, I see that uh, in South Australia, who have probably the, the largest issue with solar, uh, because of the, uh, the way that generation has been taken up there behind the meter, that they've now introduced what they call a uh, solar soap tariff. Now, the idea there is to incentivize, again, people to use more energy during that period of the day when the solar is generating. And of course, that's uh, you know, in the, in the mid-afternoon, late afternoon, and they're giving a, um, a discount on energy rates to try and encourage more usage there. So again, it's a bit of truth still. Uh, what that doesn't address, though, is things that happen more quickly. Uh, you, know, you can only influence a consumer so much, and that's over a long period of time. But things that happen more quickly that need to be dynamically controlled are not really being addressed. And that's when, you know, if you've got a suburb and, uh, you know, you may have 400 consumers attached to a distribution transformer and uh, a cloud comes over and all of a sudden you lose that generation and you need to be able to measure and respond to that fairly quickly. Uh, United Energy have done a few things in that regard uh, to try and use the uh, mass rollout of smart meters in Victoria. Some 2.7 million meters have been installed, 630,000 of them on um, UE's network. They've been pretty clever. Yeah. They were lucky enough to uh, select a meter vendor that could provide them instantaneous voltage, current, power factor. But having said that, given the nature of uh, and the size of the system, the best they can do is get down to sort of 10 second reporting, uh, not necessarily timestamped. And uh, they can only manage that with their bandwidth across a few hundred customers. So it's quite limited. Um, <laughs> and uh, since that rollout, uh, we've had a, a major change in the ownership and the uh, deployment of meters. It's no longer the responsibility of distribution networks. So we're not seeing that mass rollout of meters. And the uh, minimum specification for those new meters doesn't include anything really that can do what um, is being done in Victoria. So sort of in those other states, uh, uh, Western Australia included, the ability to get fast response just isn't there through, through the meter rollout. Uh, another thing that's been taken up in South Australia because as I said, they got this real problem now so they have now introduced a requirement for all new smart meters, even though they're run by independent parties, to uh, be able to island the solar generators behind the meter. So actually just switch the inverters out of line. So no communication of the, the inverter, just switch them out of line. And that's requiring you know, some market model changes and, uh, and new agents uh, to be able to manage all of that. It, it does seem to me that, um, you know, we, we always had this problem in Australia of different states doing different things. Uh, the NEM itself is one huge machine and it really needs a control system across all of that. Uh, is, is that the sort of thing that you're envisaging? Michael, um, I think you, you set the table for a nice uh, comment here on, on my side. And, and, and I think people understand maybe more what, I'm, what I was trying to say through the presentation. Um, you know, in, in my electronic world, when we design um, a, a, a device, for instance, a microprocessor, um, we have a 3.3 volt uh, generic supply, but at the processor itself, we have uh, 1.2 volts, 1.9 volts, various different uh, regulators uh, controlling the voltage at point of consumption um, to, to exactly the right thing. And I think this is something that, uh, that need to change within the Australian uh, paradigm of thinking. And it means that every single generator of electricity has to comply to grid codes. So you, 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 you've got to control uh, and, and it needs to be autonomous. So if the voltage is too high at a specific point, it must automatically be switched off. Um, if, if you understand the same thing is happening if the substation is out of control and that's it, it must automatically be switched off. And uh, so, because the centralized control paradigm 
is not going to work. It's just going to, the scale of it and the communication infrastructure that you require is just not going to work. And that's what the um, uh, British uh, uh, guys managed to get right, is they said as a network operator, I cannot take responsibility of network stability. So what I'm doing is I'm spelling out the rules that everybody has to play out and those rules will ensure that the grid stays stable. And, and uh, I think the responsibility, the, the, the behind the meter generators have all the benefit of um, access to market and all these kind of things, but there's also a responsibility and uh, that responsibility has to be taken up. And the utility themselves just cannot monitor every single, and carry the burden of monitoring every single um, electricity supplier or behind the meter generator. That burden has to be taken up, has to be taken up by the um, end user or the, the, the individual that owns um, the behind the meter generation solution. I, 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 maybe you guys can make comment on what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, I think I understand exactly what you're saying, Willie, but I may be singing to the choir. Um, but carrying on from what Michael said a moment ago, I mean, one of the AEMO lectures I followed, and I think Michael might have been in that group, that was the uh, ESIG down under group. Um, uh, Jenny Reese, who is one of the head honchos there, oh, well, at the, at, the, at the technical end, was talking about South Australia and a slightly different case to the one that Michael describes, but which also illustrates the need for wholesale monitoring. Um, if you are producing a lot of solar energy, and let's say um, you have a critical event happening in your network, could be anything, uh, a massive breakdown somewhere. Um, you island a whole bunch of solar inverters and for several seconds or longer, um, as you restore power, you either get massive voltage swings when all those inverters come back online or, and that's actually happened, a emo is islanded South Australia because the Haywood interconnector was beyond capacity. So you follow the example? Absolute. And that illustrates, if nothing else, that unless you taking Michael's words of a big machine, you monitor the whole machine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> on a second by second basis, so to speak, you really are putting yourself in order to preserve, a, to, to guard against a system black, well, what you do is you island. I think you were giving the South African example about there's no voltage collapse because well before it happens, you cut off you cut yeah. off large sections of the network, which is the easy way of solving the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That certainly doesn't win any votes, Phil. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm not a politician, Michael. Uh, it's all driven by politics, my friend. So, okay. Well, Willie, I think this was very interesting. Yeah. I think, I think the, the challenge that, that people have to realize is that uh, central control is by nature just too slow. Um, yes. it, by nature, it's just too slow. The, 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 the amount of money that you're going to spend to bring everything to a central place and make decision is just going to completely outweighs the benefit that you get. Decentralized control is the way forward. And, and if we can spell out rules for um, uh, inverters to how will they, um, and, and make it part of the, whether it's change and adapt the fleet somehow, um, so, so that new stuff that come in can um, uh, ride through phase jumps and, and, and so on, um, that would be fantastic. If, if, if I can also make a comment um, we were one of the first devices internationally on the market to record the phase angle jumps um, during uh, voltage sags. And uh, that was done almost 20 years ago. And uh, I, I almost fell on my back when I saw the first 45 degrees, 30 degrees phase jump and, and so on. It is mm. tremendous. Um, mm. you, you, you sometimes have a, a sine wave where the sine wave 
uh, it comes down, it literally goes up and it starts coming down again um, on the other side. So it's, it's, it's amazing that the, the phase jumps. And I think we can relate, the network in South Africa can relate closer to Australian than, for instance, the European market. Um, we also have the long lines and lightly loaded, heavily loaded and, and all these kind of things. So we, we not similar, but more related to your kind of network. Phase jumps are a tremendous, uh, a, a big thing. Uh, when cap banks switch in, um, it, it, uh, large significant loads that drop, um, transformers being switched out. Um, and, and another one that caused tremendous phase jumps is when um, tap changes are not properly synchronized. Um, unsynchronized, yes. when, and so on, they generate a lot of VARs instantaneously. And uh, the tap changes are slow, they respond five, 10, seconds um, after being switched in. And then you have the phase jump when it's incorrectly switched in and the phase jump when it's switched back. Yep. So the, 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 I think what I'm also trying to say is the dynamic behavior, and this is where the edge computing comes in. And this is where we still, and, and that if that, in that royal we, I include myself, um, we still have to learn a lot about the dynamics of the grid. How does it look like on a renewable plant, uh, um, uh, an IPP sitting on a, an, an external line? How is the dynamic performance looking there? How does the dynamic performance look like in the grid, on the inverter itself? Um, you know, it's, it's characteristics that we don't know. We don't know what's going on. How does it, how does it look on a, a pole mounted transformer? What is the dynamic behavior of the load there? Yes. Um, one of the things, Willie, and I'm going to have to go shortly, but uh, is um, I haven't really talked about that, which are marginal losses, um, which are which for remote area zones, uh, marginal loss factors are very high. They're of course based on facts, but they're actually a, a figure that is simply. <clears throat> revised on a year-to-year -year basis, as far as I know. It's made lots of solar farms, particularly in the northwest corner of Victoria and southwest New South Wales, um, uneconomical. And it would seem to me a trivial thing if you had Otello and monitors to measure instantaneous power. Um, and actually assess on a second by second basis, your net power transmitted rather than applying a rather crude uh, one figure loss factor. So again, two things jump to mind. The one is that inherent accuracy of data is very important. Um, and, and uh, luckily, we're not, talk about, we're not talking about harmonics and the higher order things, because uh, this, is a, this is another topic to discuss, and this is the inaccuracy of um, sensors out in the field, especially with harmonics. And, and uh, there, there is something new on the market there that addresses that, and that's the low power V piece. But we can talk about that maybe in a, uh, just after this. But you've got to have accurate data. And the, thing, and the second thing is you've got to have time synchronized data. And uh, the, the third thing is you've got to monitor every single node. So you've got to be very, very complete on that one. And I think if you have all of that, um, the power quality standard and the trend of data coming off uh, Otello, the default trend is 10 minutes. So um, at least uh, on every 10 minute boundary, um, you can audit and um, uh, calculate the real technical losses. Um, if, if I can call or sh an, an example, for instance, here in Stellenbosch, um, we monitor two 66 kV supply points to the, to the town, and uh, they've got 13 um, transformers, uh, 66 to 11 kV transformers. So we monitor the output of each one of these transformers. Now, when we combine the active energy, um, we get uh, a, a, a loss for between one and 2%. Now, keep in mind that loss includes all inaccuracies of um, uh, the, the sensors and, and, and the, the actual technical loss as well. 
um, in it. But anyway, it ties up to roughly one, between one and 2% on that side. But when we combined the reactive energy, we found that there was on a 50 megawatt um, uh, system, uh, 15 megavar missing. So just between the transformers and the um, ESCOM supply point, 15 megavar was drawn um, unspoken for. And we found that that was actually the capacitance of the cables lying in the ground. Now, this, this particular town is one of the first towns that had cables in there and the, the municipality kept all the cables live uh, and, and because they're still operating. So as, as backup and so on. But the net negative effect of that was that doesn't matter what they do, they've got a leading power factor. Um, this is the kind of information that uh, I think will become known the moment when you synchronize data, you know, when you do loss factors and you combine all the energy together and so on, the fact that you don't, that, that you don't have accuracy and that you don't have time synchronized data um, makes the error big. It's, it's not a small error that you make. Okay, well, I think you've answered the question. Willie, 